Hello, wonderful beings. Welcome back to another episode of Nerd Talk. And today I'm speaking with fellow Canadian foot nerd, Matt O'Mara. And our topic of discussion is going to be gluten. Uh, Matt and I have done a few podcasts together. So if you want an intro to who Matt O'Mara is and why he's, uh, I think, a potent resource when it comes to food, you can check out episode number eight of Nerd Talk. That was where he got introduced. Uh, Matt, thanks for taking the time. And I'm pretty stoked for our chat today. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Nick. No worries. I don't think I ever would have thought I, myself saying I'm stoked about talking about gluten. I, really, I, I just yeah. don't think that ever would have, someone would have told me, I would have said that. I'm like, you're crazy. Um, yeah. But but you sent me this uh, podcast from Dr. Mark Hyman. I think it's called The Doctor's Pharmacy. Yeah. Um, maybe like a month and a half ago. Time kind of flies, so it's hard to tell. But uh, it got me super interested. And there was a lot of very insightful things and connections that were made that was like, I never kind of thought of, but I think are worth um, mentioning. So maybe, you know, I figured maybe the best way to kick this off is like, what the heck is gluten? I think gluten has gotten so, some serious press um, where like everyone knows gluten. Everyone has heard the word gluten, right? Probably because they've read it on umpteen packaging things that have gluten free written on it. Um, I can't remember. I think I saw a water bottle one time that said gluten free. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> this is getting ridiculous. I think it was actually a joke. But also I was like, yeah. I don't know if people think that's a joke. Um, I was gonna say they're, they're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, they're not wrong. But it's also like, does it need to be listed? I don't know. Maybe yeah. people buy it because it says that. So let's start. I'd love to hear like, what is gluten? If I if I come up to you and Matt, I've heard of gluten. I don't know what the heck it is. Uh, if you could shed some light on that, that'd be great. Totally. Um, so to keep it like simple, gluten is essentially a protein. Um, it's a couple proteins and name, you know, there's other stuff, gliadin and things like that. We'll think of gluten as a protein, you know, one of the kind of three macronutrients of, you know, proteins, carbs and fats. Gluten is just a protein. Uh, proteins are generally hard to digest uh, when they hit our digestive system. It takes a little bit of time to kind of unravel and break them down into their component parts, which are called amino acids. Um, and, and that's kind of the basis of it. And I think that's where we need to kind of like chat about today because gluten is not usually the issue. The issue usually comes with the dosage. Um, gotcha because most people are totally fine at digesting proteins, you know, like we get proteins, like a, another great example is, um, you know, soy, soy is a, as a difficult to digest protein. And a lot of people that have troubles digesting soy, um, again, it comes more in the issue of it's the dosage, they're having like too much of it, or they need to work more in their digestive process to break it down. Cool. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Thanks for that. And I think um, even something that I've sort of started to see is that not all glutens are the same. Um, the way that gluten was in its, in its sort of natural state before we started to meddle with the genetics or the, you know, how we grow plants. And also um, that gluten isn't new. Like this isn't, this didn't just like come out in foods. Like I think gluten, we've, we've been in this interaction with gluten for a long time. Um, and I don't think there's been a massive history of us having issues with gluten. So something changed in the environment that put our relationship with gluten in a different state now where it's giving us problems. And so, you know, hopefully we can get into some of the things that might, you know, some hypothesis that might be um, shed some light on why things change so much. Because I know that um, uh, I think Robert Kennedy was his name, talks about how 2006, like things exploded with people having gluten intolerances with celiac disease blowing up and with us having a lot of issues with wheat. And they're, they're you know, we can, we'll get into that a bit later. But um, so that lets us know kind of what is gluten. And, and you know, even in your words, why is it worth us doing a podcast on the topic of gluten? Why is it something that um, needs to be sort of clarified or better understood in the common culture? Yeah, I think uh, the, the best reason to do the podcast is I think there's a lot of fear around gluten and like the thought that maybe it's, uh, you know, we hear the word like anti-nutrient and inflammatory. Um, I think a lot of people think that if they eat gluten, uh, you know, their bodies will somehow start to self combust internally, uh, <laughs> you know, which, which is, which is really invalid because gluten is a, just a protein that's found in like a natural food source. Um, and I think our perspective, and we can talk a little bit about this later, our perspective on food plays a really important role in how we digest and how things work. And mm -hmm. if you think of food as naturally bad for you, um, you kind of create that truth, right? Like if you think if you eat something with gluten, it's going to be inflammatory and unhealthy. Uh, it is, you'll kind of create that response. 
Whereas if you eat gluten and you think, you know, it's a difficult to digest protein, but I have a good digestive system, I digest it fine, and I think it'll be good. Um, usually, you'll have a much more positive outcome. So I think, you know, our minds are so powerful in the digestive process. I think it's really important to try to dispel a lot of the, the fear and maybe myths around gluten, because there's so many opinions that float around these days. Right. Yeah. This is not going to be a gluten bashing podcast. It'll be a uh, gluten awareness podcast. And I think exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I love that because it, it, like one of the things I've come to realize in my own life is that if I think something's good for me, or if I think something is bad for me, either way, I'm right. Because exactly. it actually, like, it doesn't actually matter what other people tell you. And it's sure you can look at research and science and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you really have to do your own experiment and the, your preconceived beliefs going into that experiment uh, can largely determine the results of that experiment, whether, you know, whether they're true physiological things or mental, it's like, there is kind of no barrier there. So it's, uh, I think that you're right, when people are like, Oh, I'm going to eat pizza, but I'm going to feel like shit after it's like, yeah, you probably will, because you've already made up your mind. Um, but I think if we put things into context, and even just have a better understanding of, well, it's not bad, and it's not good, but the way you consume that, or the type that you consume can make it such. I think if we clarify that, people will feel less. Well, the goal is for people to feel that gluten is less evil, and also dispel the fact that you know if gluten is giving you problems, maybe it's not nature's fault. Maybe it's something we've done as humans, or something that you're doing personally with how you're consuming it. So, um, do you come across a lot? Of, like, is this a in your own practice? Because um, I know you work a lot. Uh, with food with people. Um, is this something that comes up frequently? And like, have you found yourself having more conversations or going about your conversations about this topic differently lately? Yeah, so I found um, it's definitely something that comes up quite a bit, right? Because a lot of people will come in, um, you know, our culture really likes to follow uh, whether you want to call them fad diets or specific eating guidelines. Um, we really like to take kind of direction from you know, other authority figures or people that are considered experts and kind of implement them in their own lives. And I always get people to kind of question that and be like, you know, an expert and even us talking, we can give examples, but your own individual experience is how you determine what your relationship with gluten is, right? So I can tell you all day that gluten is great for you um, or bad for you either way. Um, and if you're a celiac, you personally are like never going to eat gluten because, you know, a celiac, someone with celiac disease just can't tolerate the gluten protein. They don't break it down. Um, so I think, you know, with what we talk about, individuality is really important, which is what I tell people all the time in my clinic. But I do see a lot of people that have maybe adopted the gluten-free uh, lifestyle with hopes of, you know, it being anti-inflammatory, it helping their digestive process. Um, and we can chat about that there are ways in which it can help to remove gluten for periods of time, especially if you really dose yourself with gluten at every meal. Um, but for the most part, gluten-free diets and you'll see with gluten-free foods, is I usually tell people, if you're doing a gluten-free diet, you can't eat anything that says gluten-free on it either. Um, because, you know, gluten-free bread is usually more processed uh, right. than the other bread you're going to get in the store. So you're not helping yourself in any way. So right. I usually say, you know, if you're going to go for that and take out gluten for a while to see if it's affecting your digestion, you don't get to have the gluten-free cookies. You don't get the gluten-free bread or pasta. You just take out that thing and replace it with whole foods, you know, sweet potatoes, potatoes, you know, beets, yams, whatever, natural carbohydrate sources. Yeah, that's a great point. Because I think, you know, once it's food science is so damn hard to do, because it's such, a, such an individualistic thing in terms of like, um, I remember I was listening to actually, this was very recently a, a podcast on the feel better live more platform. And a guy was talking about food and he was talking, this was a scientist that did a lot of work with twin studies. And what he found that like these identical twins are genetically identical. Um, and even if they were raised in, fair, in, in the same household, their microbiomes differ hugely. And when you understand that the microbiome is one of the chief players, this little ecosystem that we all have in our guts uh, is one of the chief players in how you digest and react to food. Well, even if you're genetically identical, you can have an extremely different ecosystem in your gut, which means you will react to foods very differently. And so even if twins is hard to do, it's like, you can tell that like a research study in, you know, even a well done, very, very fairly well done study, it's really hard to extrapolate any of those results in a meaningful way, because that's a tiny snapshot of a tiny group of people of a tiny group of isolated variables. It's like, how informative is that study really? And the shitty part is, food companies will just jump on a study that confirms something that aligns with their marketing campaign for the next six months. 
And then the world treats it as gospel. And it's like, whoa, 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 let's take a step back. And like, they took one piece of the puzzle, they put some like fancy stuff on it and are trying to sell it to you as the miracle food. It's like, I think we need to just question things a little bit and take that with a grain of salt. Um, and yeah, I just think that food science is still a young science and it just reiterates the fact that personal experience and you being honest with yourself and reclaiming like this language that your body talks to you all the time, but that you're, you seem to, most people just don't seem to listen to that language. They've become like illiterate to talking with their own bodies and feeling when you say to someone, well, how does that food make you feel? Sometimes it's just like a blank stare. So like, I don't even know what feel means anymore in terms of, you know, and so I think at the end, we'll talk about more pragmatic tips, but even just taking, giving people sort of a, a very, very basic framework for doing something like a, a, an elimination, um, so eliminating certain foods and really taking like a daily note on like, how do I feel today? What are metrics that I can track? How can I do an experiment that is more than just taking this global approach of like, I think I feel good today. So that's a success. It's like, well, how did you like, there's a lot of variables. So breaking that down. And I think basic experimental design is almost part of giving people back responsibility because then they're able to do their own experiments without needing to, to be handheld the whole time. Um, so, and let's just talk about just briefly celiac. What is celiac disease? Um, you know, is it genetic? What is the, because I've read a bunch of things and they kind of conflict each other. Like, a, you know, one thing I saw was, or I think even Mark says it, 35% of people have the celiac gene, only 1% of people end up developing uh, or claiming to develop a, a, a celiac problem. Um, and I know that celiac is the is sort of an autoimmune issue based on issues digesting the gluten protein family. But is there anything you can speak to about, about your experience with celiac disease? Yeah, so celiac disease, um, I, you know, it falls into that immune reaction category where, um, you know, the body recognizes gliadin or gluten as being like an invasive pathogen, essentially, and attacking it. Um, and creating like an inflammatory response, which eventually damages your gut lining and, you know, can cascade into being like a, a pretty serious illness, um, mm -hmm. especially if it's, it can be hard to recognize off the bat without an elimination diet or working with, you know, a naturopath or nutritionist, because, it, you know, you can point at so many things that aggravate the gut. Um, right. So yeah, with people when they start to develop celiac, because they're usually not necessarily born with it, um, it is important to kind of diagnose it off the bat. Um, that being said, there's, there's a lot of interesting theories about what we think of as autoimmune or where the immune system kind of attacks the body. And I think people have a lot of genes for autoimmune issues, like we all do. But essentially, you know, the bigger picture is if you balance your lifestyle, you know, early on, you know, through exercise, movement, social, like all the things that we, you know, talk about in the foot nerve program and those kind of things, you have a much lower chance of creating an autoimmune response. Because right. an autoimmune response is a stress response. It's an immune system that is trying to protect you, but is either you know overworked or just not working the way that it's designed to. Um, and we, you essentially the flare up happens. Maybe it comes as celiac. Maybe it comes as you know rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it can show up as so many different things in people depending on you know what their genes are and what their they have a propensity towards. But but really, um, yeah, celiac is. If it, once you have celiac, you don't tolerate gluten or gliadin, like in any form, like a, like someone with celiac um, disease or disorder, uh, if they used like a toaster that someone had toasted a gluten containing bread in previous, um, and they got a particle on it, they could have a full blown reaction to it. Wow. So, so someone that's like a true celiac is like very hypersensitive to gluten uh, and the gliadin kind of protein. Um, and, and do people that have those reactions, are they people that have had that forever? Or is it basically at a certain point, the body sort of makes up its mind where it's like the vote is in, this is not good for us to have, let's put all hands on deck if we encounter it. Or is it like, like, is that from day one? Or do these people come in and say, you know, this just started, I'm having really strong reactions. So there, you know, it seems to me like there's some sort of trigger that the body encounters whether it's overwhelmed with something to the point where it gets deemed in the bad category or whether there's an artificial thing like you know if some chemical was put on something you ate and that had gluten well if you already had a bit of a trigger from gluten and then you add this extra uh you know toxin to that maybe that is what it's like a um you know we're studying we're doing the vaccine task force right now and they put these 
um, things in vaccines to create a stronger reaction. They put toxins like aluminum or whatever it might be, um, these adjuvants. It's like, if we're adding chemicals to grow certain things that are already have a propensity to trigger people, that could act as an adjuvant to just create an overreaction and a, and a stored memory in our, in our you know, defense cells to then just go haywire for nothing. And it seems like that might be part of this equation as well. Totally. And it's definitely a part of like the, the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which uh, is another term. So like it's, you're still react to gluten, but you're not diagnosed as a celiac. It happens much more in that category where there's, you know, toxins on the foods or stuff like that, that create this, you know, kind of chain reaction of stuff. Um, with people that are celiac, there's, that can play a role, but you know, because they have like a bit of a genetic predisposition to it, like it can just be they eat healthy, but their work is really stressful or mm -hmm. their home life is really stressful. And, and that can be what pushes them into. Right. And then once, once it's kind of been triggered, it's, it's really challenging if, you know, impossible is not a word you ever want to use, but um, I'm not aware of like very many situations where people have been able to kind of like reverse that without like pretty, intensive therapies and stuff like that which most people you know it's much easier just to avoid gluten than to spend you know tens of thousands of dollars trying to be able to eat it again which probably you know is another thing to talk about yeah you gotta really like <laughs> gluten to yeah. go through that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you're right that's another story yeah. <laughs> I, I like that you brought it back to this whole sort of like you know the multi-pillar approach we have with the footner program and how those are really just abstractions to separate. Okay, these are elements of health, but they all bi-directionally affect each other. And I think what you brought up is a good point. It's like, if all the other, if some of the other pillars aren't getting taken care of, you just have a lower resilience threshold when your body starts to get overwhelmed. And I think totally. we underestimate how much power we have to build resilience and robustness in those other areas. If we know one of them is an issue and there's no instant fix, well, you can buffer, you can beef up all the other ones to give you this bigger capacity to then embark on trying to figure something out. And I think that's so important. And it's something that I never knew in the past. It's like, yeah, how, if, whether you meet your movement, physiological movement needs plays a big part in how much reserve capacity your body has to fight other things. Um, and it just gives you more levers to toggle if you're struggling. It's like, well, I know I have, I can control what time I go to bed, what time I wake up and what I'm doing around bedtime. Like I can control the quality of my sleep. I can control what I'm putting in my mouth or how much I'm moving. So we, we just have a lot of control that I don't think is really mentioned uh, or, or like given to us or reminded to us in, in the current, you know, quote unquote healthcare system where it's, you know, our disease management system sucks at helping us understand what we can do other than that specialist you're going to see, what else we can do to really make allow your body to be better at fighting these things or allow your body to be better at figuring things out. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. There's a lot of great points in there, Nick. And I think that it comes down to, you got to take ownership of your own health, right? Yeah. It's not, not your doctor's responsibility. It's not your partner's responsibility. You know, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your health for, you know, going to the doctor if needed, following up on tests, kind of getting what's needed. And I think we have a tendency partially because people, you know, they work, pretty hard. And I think we can wear ourselves down to the point where it's easy to just like ask someone to do it for you, right? Yep. It's easier to just, you know, follow a diet where someone's laid out, this is what you can eat, this is what you can't. And you can just go for it. But I think it's really important, especially in this area, to take like full ownership of it and really take the time to assess your own health. And I think when people need it the most is when it's the hardest to do. Um, you know, so if you're in like an autoimmune condition, it is the hardest to take ownership there because you're, you're low on energy, you're high on stress, like all this mm -hmm. stuff comes into play. So the, the, you know, the moral of the story is preventative medicine is the best medicine. So if you're feeling good now, now is the time to figure it out, to figure out what your foods are that are great, what movement works for you, you know, what lifestyle leads you to the highest level of kind of satisfaction and health. Because if you wait until you're sick, it's, it's much harder to, to reverse and to, to sort out. Yeah, that's a great point. It's almost like you're every single day, your behaviors are putting some money in your in your health piggy bank, because it, it's really important to have stuff in there when you need it. And you can't really put stuff in there when you do need it most. And I, and even what you said there, like reinforces when it's hardest to do something to, to improve your health at a time where you're having like maybe a health crisis, like that's when the community element is so huge to have a network of people who support you, which is something you need to build 
into your lifestyle. It's not something you're just like, all right, let's go out and grab some people in my community that love me and will support me when I'm having trouble. It's like, you have to cultivate that. You have to know that every single day as a human, you have to be working on these things to get paid the dividends down the road, which are often in the form of you never have these catastrophes, but also if you do have them, you're able to bounce back and be way more resilient if you've done the right things leading up to there. And I think we're so we're so instant gratification oriented. It's like, I, I need this. I want this when I need it. It's like, well, you have to work towards it so that a, hopefully you never need it, but if you do, it's there. And I think we just have to, we have to think big health instead of just like little health of like instantaneous problems versus like my entire lifespan is where I need to focus on health to varying degrees. And I, I think if we took that mindset, it also liberates you a little bit because it's like, you don't have to do everything. Just do a little bit each day, do a tiny little thing each day. And the cumulative effect of that will be massive. Um, yeah. All right. Let's get back to gluten. Uh, but I think, but I think it's all relevant. I mean, a conversation about gluten should go to that point. I, I think, um, you know, I really think that that's whole, that's the part of the whole awareness piece of the biggest rate limiting step. I think with health is fundamentally awareness. People aren't aware of what is actually causing the problem. And I love the saying that a problem understood is half solved. And people just took an inkling to, to know that they are capable of understanding the basics of how their bodies work. Um, then it's much, it's much easier and less intimidating to lean into that and to try and learn things um, than if you think that the body's so complex that only doctors can understand it. Totally. And, and, you know, with most medicine, like the body is really complex, but it's really intelligent. So right. if you give it the building blocks, and this is how I always explain acupuncture to people. Um, so acupuncture is a, a form of, uh, you know, medicine, and I do sports medicine and, and traditional acupuncture, where you know, I mean, you essentially put needles into people and they get better, which is like on the surface, you're like, how does that work? Um, but if you think about it, like the one of the great things acupuncture does is it helps put us in this parasympathetic or rest and digest nervous system, which is part of our autonomic nervous system. We also have the sympathetic or fight or flight, right? Which is our stress response nervous system. Mm -hmm. The ability to switch between the two nervous systems is really important and an area that a lot of people are lacking in these days. Right. Uh, so when you're in the parasympathetic arrest and digest, uh, you metabolize like cortisol and stress hormones, your body runs really well, like that you digest food properly, like you sleep well, like everything works well in the system. So I, like the way I kind of see acupuncture in, in flipping to a more Western perspective is acupuncture almost always puts the body into a state of parasympathetic rest, which allows the body to run how it's supposed to. So it's not like this miracle that fixes you. Your body is actually the intelligence that fixes you. You're just giving it the time to do it. And that's what eating well does. That's what sleeping well does. It gives your body the ability to run how it's supposed to. Um, and if it's able to do that, it, it fixes everything. It sorts it out. You don't have to figure out these really like particular details and kind of chase down the branches of disease. You can kind of fix the root of it. Um, and I think that's where I go to with, with my nutrition, with my practice, with everything. Yeah, that is great. And I think like right now I'm sort of ramping up the note taking on this whole health pro community for next year. And one of the manifesto elements is like understanding and unpacking that the body is a self-organizing self-healing system. And if you can kill yourself by trying to understand how it does all the magic, but you can also just know that if I give it the right stuff, I can trust that it's going to know how to do its magic without me needing to understand every part. And I find we often focus on uh, outputs and trying to resolve output problems when really we need to focus on inputs. Like if I'm doing, if I'm giving my body the right things, um, I can trust that my biology has got this and I just have to focus on the inputs. And I think that's also a little bit liberating and allows you to relax into it a bit or it's like, okay, my job is way easier than my body's. I know my body can do its job. I have to do my job though. And I don't even have to worry about what it's doing all the time. Um, and, you know, even your, when you mentioned the two different kind of sympathetic parasympathetic states, it kind of brought up this image of that I get sometimes where it's like someone eats a food and they feel fine. Um, you know, they're sitting at home calm, they're with their family. Someone eats that exact same food in rush hour traffic when they're trying to talk on the phone in a meeting and someone's honking at them and they just got cut off. That food is being interpreted in a totally different way than the calm meal at home. So it, it just gets into like, there's so many layers of variables that 
you just have to know, okay, humans are not supposed to be cramming food in their mouths when they're in a high stress state. Like that's a basic fundamental heuristic. I don't think anyone would disagree with that, but that makes a big difference because so many people, like it's crazy how many people I see eating food when I'm driving. And it's oh, like, yeah. that. it's so shocking. It's like, we've, we've tried to cram so much stuff into our lives. We don't even have time to sit down for five minutes and eat some food in a calm state. We literally have to do it from, as we're rushing from point A to point B. And I think there's something there too with how your body reacts to food. Sometimes it's not what you're eating always, although that definitely has a probably a, a big, um, a big bearing on it, but sometimes it's how you're eating, what state you're in when you're eating. Um, so like, yeah, there's a, there's a lot, but at the same time, it's like focus on inputs and know the basic heuristics and you can do pretty good. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Like we just talked about like ownership and stuff like that. Like, you know, if you're not dealing with all those stuff, you know, the, the 90% of health, then it's not, it's challenging to go and ask for like a doctor's advice or a healthcare professional's advice, because most of what they want you to do, you know, the healthy eating, the movement and stuff is what you should do first. And if then if that doesn't fix it, then that's when you should kind of seek, you know, like the medical attention. Because if you're not eating well, therefore you're not sleeping well, therefore you're not moving well, this kind of thing that creates so many problems on its own. And it's impossible for like a healthcare practitioner to figure out if this is from you not moving well, or if this is actually right. like a, a hormonal imbalance or something else going on, because you're kind of not doing like your part in your health, you're hoping that someone else can just give you, you know, the magic pill kind of thing that will fix everything. Whereas like, you know, there's a lot of work that has to go in to kind of achieve optimal health but if you do those baby steps every day you'll just maintain it if you don't do the baby steps for you know a couple decades things definitely catch up with you you know it's uh, just a definitely a good way to look at it yeah and it's sometimes i think of a metaphor when people go in and see their doctor it's like it's like you have a massive bundle of christmas lights and they're all tangled up it's like before you go to an electrician and say hey hey something's wrong with these lights uh, um, can you find out which one is the one that's messed up? And you put a massive ball of tangled lights on their desk. They're going to be like, uh, can you untangle them first? It's like, totally. we need to untangle our health shit before we go to the doctor. So that we'd be like, well, this is what I found. You know, this is, and the doctor can be like, all right, well, I'll test these light bulbs because I'm really good at doing that. Uh, but yeah. you have to untangle it before you go. And I think we just haven't even been given the chance to untangle our own health mess uh, because we don't have been given the basic tools. And I think that this, you know, that's really what the whole mission at TFC is about is like, People need to like, hello, people don't even know the basics. Let's just talk about that before we talk about all the crazy complex shit that science is doing. How about we just talk about doing the bare, bare basics that like a 10 year old should know and intuitively and should be taught in school. We forget that we haven't learned that stuff or the bulk of people haven't learned it. And if we had a tool that people could use that was free, that allowed them to obtain those basics, the, the visits with healthcare practitioners are so much more meaningful and effective if those basics have already been internalized, understood, and even worked on so that some of the untangling was done. You know, it's better than no untangling. So I think, yeah, just basic fundamental knowledge on all five pillars of health on just like 10 year old level stuff um, that can do so much good. And the question is like, what's the most effective way to convey that to, to humans? And I think that, you know, like one of the next task forces is going to be to create, we have so many teachers with the Footner program and that whole month schooling project was really cool. And I think, you know, I was talking to Ruth and we were like, well, why don't we just create a, a really cool curriculum that's experiential. It's not just like learning information. It's actually like doing fun things um, that touches on all five pillars of health that provides basically a turnkey option for teachers and just open source it. And then mm -hmm. provide letters like PDFs that parents can send their school board and say, hey, this is free. This can be implemented by our school. This is why it's important. And I think there's like a gorilla way to go grassroots and figure out like <laughs> this can be done because then those kids can teach their parents. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so let's talk about, uh, I'd love to talk about wheat and we, you kind of touched on this before where, and I, I don't even know if we talked about this before we recorded or if it was when we were recording, but the wheat that used to be is not so much the wheat that currently is. Um, totally. And even different parts of the world, right? We go to Italy, they grow wheat very differently than the way we grow it in mass quantities in North America. Um, and it's, I, there's something there that wheat has changed and morphed because of what we've done to it. Um, so let's talk about that and how that might be sort of a contributor to the problems that we're having with gluten or the problems that we're having 
eating wheat now? Yeah. So, you know, one of the interesting things, the first thing we'll talk about is the way that we've actually like uh, bred our wheat over the last couple of decades or more uh, to essentially be more productive, right? To have more of the actual wheat product that we take off of it. Because if you take, you know, a traditional huh, 150 years ago, like a stalk of wheat growing, it's a long piece of grass. And on the end, you know, there's that little piece of wheat and that's the valuable part that we take from it. Right. Um, you know, in North America here, for sure, we're all about, we're all about quantity over quality. Like yeah. we want the most bang for our buck. <laughs> the uh, most for so the cheapest. We, totally. So we, you know, we took wheat and through, you know, genetic modification and through just like taking different wheat strains and putting them together. So they breed together, which is kind of another form of genetic modification. Uh, we slowly created wheat that is kind of like pretty robust and you get like a big, massive chunk of wheat per stock. So right. like your, your quantity output is, is huge. It's greatly varied. Uh, or sorry, if it greatly increased. And we did the same thing with corn, right? Like when you think of corn, there's like, I think there's thousands of varieties of corns, different colors, different nutrient densities. And we're like, no, we want giant yellow ears of corn. Like we want- only optimize for one variable. It's yeah. such a dumb way of doing it. It's, it's, it's crazy, right? And then we breed out all the other ones right. and it's just like wild. So we've done it with lots of things, but we'll use wheat as an example. So this really dense uh, wheat that we get in like high quantity now, uh, it's a lot higher in gluten than it used to be, like like substantially higher. So there in itself is an increase in gluten. And, and you know, the more you increase a protein, the more people have difficulty digesting it because you have more right. proteins to break down. So you need to have a stronger digestive system. So there's, there's the first part is there's literally just more gluten in most of the wheat we buy nowadays. Yep. Um, the second part is we, we really moved away from you know, what can be thought of as the proper or the, you know, the more ancient way of preparing things. And wheat used to be prepared, it used to be three ingredients, it used to be flour, water, and thyme. You would put the flour, water, and that together, have your sourdough, and it would ferment, you know, over a period of time. The fermentation process breaks down gluten for us. It literally mm -hmm. breaks the protein down, so it becomes more bioavailable, which means it's just easier for us to digest. Uh, we, we moved away from that, right? Because not only do we want stuff in quantity, we want stuff like right now, and we want it to be fast. Right. Away from that, we created like a process where we could ferment it faster. Um, so it still ferments a little bit because that's how you get the bubbles and the rising. Um, but it's too fast. And then we've added in like sugars. And, you know, if you look at a, even a, what's considered a healthy loaf of bread nowadays, you mm -hmm. know, there's, there's, it should be flour and water, right? maybe right. a bit of salt or something, there'll be like 30 ingredients in the back. It's wild. So we have like preservatives and things to like prepare it. And we have like, you know, this array of nuts and seeds and we blend all these different like types of flowers together. And it's, it's really unnecessary because bread should be just simple at its base, right? Well, Flour, and, water and time. Yeah. And like in the seminar, I used to start off the food section by basically explaining loaf of fresh sourdough, the ingredients, and then uh, a loaf of Wonder Bread. And in Wonder Bread, there's something like, I think there's like 42 ingredients. Within those, there's three different forms of sugar. Uh, there's also many ingredients that you can't even pronounce that I, I think deserve a place in a chemistry lab, not in your stomach. And so you're right, like we make food radically differently to try and have it last longer, to do it in big quantities. And it's, we just sort of, it's so funny, it's so narrow-minded to just think that that's all gonna be fine. Like we're gonna react the same way to this weird chemistry experiment as we are to this way that we've been eating for thousands of years. And it's, it would be silly to assume that wouldn't mess us up. And yet that's the, that's the status quo. And, and you're really challenging the digestive system. So instead of you know, having you know, flour and water to digest and break down, you have these 42 ingredients. Some are chemicals, some are things. So some are like toxins that are gonna be like slightly inflammatory and damaging the system. Right. So your body has to deal with this whole lack of things and it's challenging for it, right? If I gave you, you know, two math problems to solve versus 42, like, <laughs> that's a good way like to it's it. pretty, pretty straightforward who's going to be faster, right? Right. And more efficient at it. Um, so, so that's, so, so we have, there's too much, like we kind of, we went for quantity and we took away time. Those are two big players for sure. Uh, the third one, and this is kind of what that Doctor's Pharmacy podcast with Dr. Mike Hyman talked about. Um, is in 2006, um, a company called Monsanto, which is, you know, maybe not the best guys running out there. Uh, they told farmers, so uh, glyphosate um, is something that they sprayed on the crops, crops usually um, early in the season, 
helps keeps bugs and stuff off of them, right? Round up. Um, it's it's pretty the, roundup. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty toxic stuff. But when it's sprayed on early in the season, there's rain, there's elements, there's lots of things that can uh, like wash it off, so it's it's not like literally on the plant, right? So the the amount we consume is really minimal. In 2006, uh, you know, they realized. I'm not sure. I believe this was Monsanto, like kind of told farmers. Roundup's also a desiccant, meaning it helps like dry the wheat. Um, so if you dry the wheat when it's before it's cut down, um, you have a greater crop yield. You know, we, you get quantity again, right? You don't yeah, get, you get rid of mold. spoilage. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, so now what we have in 2006 is these crops are being sprayed right before they're harvested. Well, there's no rain. There's no element. There's nothing to wash it away. Right. So we're getting, you know, Roundup glyphosate like directly into the food system now. Um, and this is where we see that gluten sensitivity, especially like the non celiac gluten sensitivity, it, it just explodes, right? And this is right. where we get that whole era from. And, you know, there's, um, it, you can never say, you know, that's the cause, but you can say there's definitely a correlation. Um, yeah. And I think it's important to never just point at one thing because there is a lot of stuff going on, but there's definitely a pretty massive correlation there. Trust, you know, we had bread that was, prepared poorly we've had wonder bread for a long time now uh we had bread that's really high in gluten content and there wasn't the explosion in gluten sensitivity sure it maybe increased it one or two percent but we didn't have like you know i'm, I'm not sure what the numbers are now but some up to 30 percent of the population is like sh choosing to be gluten-free and having this gluten sensitivity um it's pretty easy to see that something was probably introduced um you know and it could easily be this glyphosate which which is a toxin right like we just don't digest right. it that well and what it's doing is not only is do we have this challenge in gluten to to try to break down is this is also damaging our immune system so with toxins in the system it's not just gluten sensitivity we see an increase in we see an increase in all digestive disorders um you know and as research comes out now there's really good links between the gut and brain for for lots of uh, long-term diseases so we really need to be aware that digestive health really um, is synonymous with overall health because um, it's one of the ways we interact with our environment the most directly yeah yeah and it's so funny that we think so herbicide is like something that will kill plants right you're killing you're preferentially killing weed and often with roundup uh, gmo crops it's like those have been spliced with the gene that is resistant to that glyphosate chemical we assume that what is bad for plants is going to be just fine for humans. And it's so, it's so dumb because like we're all life. We're, we're actually not that different. I mean, we're not plants, but we're also not like these foreign alien things that came in to a, that are totally different from all other life. And so, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, you say correlation and, and it's hard to tell, right? Like, like you said, well, as you were mentioning the different things, how we've grown different levels of gluten, how we've prepared foods differently, it's like, I'm surprised that more people don't have issues with gluten, right? It like goes to show you how resilient we are, that we can do all this stuff to like basically completely change the composition of this protein, this is, which is already a difficult, like a, a burden to digest for our body, um, but that we often can do no problem if it's done in the right quantity. Um, and then, you know, who knows if that that explosion in 2006 when they started to be used as a desiccant was the camel that broke, was the thread, or what's the saying? The You're almost there. <laughs> something that broke the camel's back. Was the, was the final thing that pushed us over or was a significant uh, element? And even, you know, like a study published in the uh, Journal of Interdisciplinary Toxicology proposed explicitly and, and oftentimes really, you know, high I mean, I'm going to say high quality. I haven't actually read the study, but in a decent journal, to say causal uh, relationship is a is a big thing, right? Like you you have to do pretty good research to actually show some relationship of causality. And they propose that glyphosate is the most important causal factor in the increase in celiac disease and in gluten intolerance worldwide. And that's a so that says something. And even you know, like I remember they mentioned that. Glyphosate or Roundup has been around since 1976. So it's been around for a long time. 85% mm -hmm. of the Roundup ever used in history has been used since 2006. And a large part of that was used as a, as a desiccant. So it's like, we're yeah. literally loading it into our food. This, this yeah. is not rocket science. Like this, this, me <laughs> this mechanism no. seems really obvious. And, and yet the EPA uh, claims that glyphosate is safe. 
it's like, how obvious does it have to be that these institutions have literally just been captured by whatever money is thrown at them? And it's like, I think that's part of the problem is that we have to be way better informed than we should need to be because our institutions no longer serve in our best interests, right? They're basically just up for sale. The highest bidder is often the people making the most money, which is sometimes the people doing the most harm. It's just they've been able to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I just... I think it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's so crazy. And when you and, yeah. and like even the graph that shows gluten intolerance and celiac, like just shooting up at the exact time that they started using that, it's like maybe there's something there. Maybe totally. And, and I'd wager if you looked, you know, broadened your scope on maybe digestive diseases in general and looked at like all sort of uh, colitis and Crohn's and those kind of things, I think you'd see. A correlation there too. I think it would be increasing yeah. because you introduce a toxin to the digestive system. Like, of course, it's going to like have more long reaching effects. Like, of course, we see the sensitivity with gluten, but I, I think it has much deeper impacts than people realize. And yeah. I think, you know, just because you don't notice the effects, um, do you really want to willingly poison yourself in small daily doses? Like it's, you know, really, if you think of it that way, you're like, well, absolutely not. And exactly. it's like, well, I mean, that's like the easy solution uh, is, is to really move away from this like monoculture, like mass crop producing wheat, um, which is a really good segue into what should you do <laughs> if right. you still want to eat wheat? Because um, P.S. we all vote. We all vote whether we want that or whether we don't. And you vote with your fork. You vote with your dollars, basically. And if everyone mm -hmm. voted against it, it would be gone. It's just yeah. people have to be aware of it in order to know that they should vote against it in order for us to change things. And I think, um, yeah, I think we just have to know that we have way more power than we think. And if you tell one person about this podcast or you tell one person about, you know, bring up this conversation at one family dinner, that's doing a lot to spread kind of the ripples of awareness that combine to create true change. So I think don't underestimate how important every single person listening to this podcast, friends, family, whatever, that's how change happens. So, yeah, definitely. And, and so like, you know, for people that, you know, they aren't gluten sensitive and they're not celiac and they're like, you know, I, I still really like bread to some degree and I want it in my life. Um, I, there's two recommendations I have. One is, you know, the detriment is in the dosage. Um, if don't have gluten as part of every meal, like just don't, it is difficult to digest protein. Um, it is, if people come in with digestive issues, it is something we get them just to remove for a period of time, because it's very likely a cause of some, if not all of their digestive concerns, um, regardless of how it's prepared, right? If you have a sensitivity to it, you know, so we always take it out. Um, yeah. So don't, you know, don't have, you know, uh, bread for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Step one. Um, Step two is there's lots of flours out there that are not, you know, junky wheat and whole wheat. Um, so if you buy organic, uh, you have stuff like there. You can buy organic whole wheat. It's not going to be sprayed. It's not going to have the junk on it. Uh, right. They just don't do that with the organic label currently. Um, the other thing is look beyond the box. Like we don't need to just eat wheat. There's a lot of different types of grains out there. Uh, grain I really like is, is red fife. Um, it's reasonably easy to get here in BC. I don't know about Ontario or other parts of the world, but uh, red fife is, you know, it's more of an ancient grain, hasn't been like played around with as much, uh, which means it has a, a much lower gluten content than your typical whole wheat these days. Um, so if you get a red fife bread uh, and get a bakery or learn to do it yourself and make sourdough, uh, you know, right. eat bread the way it's meant to be eaten. So like, you know, flour, water, and thyme, proper sourdough recipes, um, with breads that have lower gluten content and haven't been genetically modified to, you know, like a massive degree. Um, and you're probably going to tolerate gluten just fine. Uh, for people that I see, and they're not willing to give up gluten from their diet, they're like, you know what, like, absolutely not. I'm not stopping it, which, which happens, right? Like, you know, people <laughs> Some people like, just are like, no, I will not give that up. Yeah. And give me a whopper. <laughs> yeah. And I'm happy if people are honest about that. They're like, you know, you've crossed the, it's the coffee threshold, right? If I tell people to stop drinking coffee, they're like, you're a terrible health practitioner. Yeah, I'm not coming to see you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you got to watch re, what you say. Um, but with gluten, if people are like really resistant to it, what I do is like, I still point them on the same path. It's like, where you're going to get sourdough breads, you're going to get red fife or like an einkorn mm -hmm. or like a, an old grain. Um, most of the time tolerated totally fine all the issues go away like it's it really is like i said the detriment is in the dosage so like if you decrease your gluten content uh properly prepare it with fermentation so that there is a digestible gluten content and 
and take away the the toxins um we do fine and we adapt right back to it you know like it like a lot of people be like yeah i ate it and had no issues like immediately so the body is wanting to eat these healthy sources of foods it's literally because you know over years and decades we just keep throwing junk in at it that like eventually for sure it's going to get overrun but it's a phenomenal system that is capable of self-healing so literally when you give it like a break like a week you know two weeks some people even like a couple days it, it heals and repairs and is ready to go again um a lot of this stuff just comes because we just don't give it a break we don't give it time right and i think it's very I think it's easy for people to adopt the mindset that it's binary. It's like either I eat bread or I don't, or I'm not eating bread. And it's like, in that respect, I can see how it's really hard to give up. Like a person who eats a toast and a muffin in the morning, two different kinds of bread, muffins are bread. Um, the person who eats a sandwich at lunch, the person who eats, you know, bread with dinner, like that's a lot of bread. And if you really love bread, it can suck to give it up. Like maybe you haven't hit the threshold where, you know, you have no other option, but the beauty is, like you said, it's like, you can just choose other options. You can actually not give it up. You just have to be more intelligent with how you're selecting it and how you're preparing it. Maybe take a little bit more ownership for how it's done so that you have more control over that process. Um, we have a great bakery in Ottawa called Cobbs and they make legit sourdough. They do it all in house. It's all made there on site. And when I eat bread from there, I feel great. Like there's no slowness. There's no sluggishness. There's no like, Oh God, it feels like something is, is stuck in my stomach. Um, and so, totally. yeah, I think when people know that those options are available, it, it brings it from a binary hard decision that people are often unwilling to do if they're not feeling shitty enough, um, to something that's like, okay, well, what's the harm in trying? Like, it's a little bit of extra work to research this or go and find it. It's like making an adventure out of finding a bakery locally and connecting with a baker. If that person loves making bread. They can make your bread and they can make it really well. So it's like, yeah, there's options. Yeah, there's, there's so many options. And I think it really is an exponential change, right? So when people go to like, not even Wonder Bread, but just like store bought, store bought whole wheat bread, you know, that's got low nutritional value, and they switch to something like uh, a sourdough red fife bread, uh, what they get is for sure, it's easily digestible, and it's better for you. You also get bread that's been grown organically, probably in better soil, it's going to have a lot more micronutrients in it, it's going to have more fiber in it, which is really important as well. It's going to have all these different components. So it's not just like one flip. It's like, it's like, you know, a negative two to like a plus 30. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, it's, <laughs> right. a, it's a really big shift. It's not like you're just yeah. going from negative two to positive two, you're right. making like a really positive shift. Um, and, and I think it's really important for people to realize that like when you eat healthier food, like it, it really is exponential if you're eating like in the lower end of things, you know, and, and it doesn't even need to be a big cost difference. Like mm -hmm. it, if you do your research and figure it out, a lot of these bakeries, um, we have a local bakery called True Grain and another one called Honey Grove. Uh, there is a Cobbs close to us too. Uh, you know, they freeze their bread at the end of the day and you can buy frozen bread from them you know, because they don't want it to go bad. And you just go ask me like, look, I don't want the fresh bread, I want the frozen bread, well, the nutritional value and everything's still there. Yes, it's not out of the oven fresh. But like, financially, if that's a better way for you to get your food, yeah. like, you know, options do exist. Amazing. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's really just people just think decisions are way harder than 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 they actually are. But you just have to be willing to look into it to investigate a little bit. And um yeah, I think just taking away the, even just a good exercise and self, self-awareness is like, I, I eat bread with everything. Like people that are like, wow, I eat a lot of bread. That alone is a good realization. And, you know, you say, you talk about this frame shift of like going from negative two to plus 30. It's like, think of how big of a reserve you open up for your body to apply to other areas, to healing other areas, to giving you more energy. When you take away this massive burden, that's just kind of been rumbling along. Maybe you haven't been brought to the brink of like falling apart but it's like that's a huge unburdening of your body and it has this new unleashed unlocked capacity that was there all the time but getting used up by something maybe you didn't even realize and i hear from people all the time where they're like yeah once i realized gluten was the problem and i and i solved that problem everything else felt better my brain worked better i could focus more i was literally happier like i've heard this from people and part of me is always like okay well if you think it if you think that's the case, then that is the case. But I also, when you look at it under the hood and you understand mechanistically, it's like, well, if your body's processing toxins all the time, it's a huge amount of its energy being spent on something you might not even be aware of. So I think there's something there as well, where it's like, all of a sudden you might feel like you can work out more. You can feel like you can move way more. 
or you're just better to be around. And it's something that can sometimes be not maybe directly noticeable, but if you're tuning into it, it, it can be something that you pick up and it's, it's pretty profound. So yeah, definitely. And I, I fully agree with that, right? Like if you, if there's always more power that comes from removing toxins in whatever form they are, than comes from adding beneficial stuff in. So if you're eating gluten, and it's not working for you, and everything else in your life is dialed in, but gluten is like not digestible, it creates inflammation, you're going to have way more power and way more benefit to removing gluten from your life than to like adding in another meditation session, a workout, yes. like yeah. all this stuff. There, there's always more positive that comes from removing the stuff that's causing harm. Because then at least you're at like a, an even playing field for all the beneficial stuff to take an effect. You're not like battling this consistent negative input. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point. And another thing um, I just kind of remember that Mark Hyman brought up in that podcast is that these thing, these food pro, these new food products that are coming out to solve problems. So, you know, one problem is like, okay, the way we're harvesting and growing meat is a big problem. Uh, the way that some people solve that problem in their personal lives is like, I'm not going to eat meat. Um, and so you have products like the Impossible Burger coming out. That is a GMO soy-based product. Um, and Mark Hyman's like, yeah, that burger has a hundred times the amount of glyphosate needed to destroy mammals, uh, gut lining. And it's like, we don't talk about that. We talk about how it's great that we're not eating meat, but it's also, I think we have to just be inherently skeptical of food products that are unnatural that have been okay. created in a lab and are, are, you know, seemingly solving a problem that a lot of people have identified, which rightfully so I completely agree that the way we harvest meat's a problem, but also eating some weird chemical thing. Uh, it's probably not the solution. It's not the best solution. And I think you presented yeah. a really good case for the fact that there are solutions that exist that can be simple and achievable and not financially prohibitive, but you have to be aware of them, right? Like that red fife option, or just knowing that if you make your own bread and you're willing to invest the time and energy into create, playing a bigger role in creating what you eat so that you have more control over the quality, um, that's not a huge burden, but it requires awareness that that is even on the table as an option. And I think people's menus that they feel they have to choose from to solve these problems are like minuscule or non-existent. Whereas if we help them expand the menu, we don't even have to tell them what to do. It's just like, here's a menu of things that you can try. Just be willing to try. It's worth it. Totally. I mean, yeah, the thing is, like we talked about the individual thing, like you've got to sort it out for yourself. Like yeah. we can tell you all day gluten is good for you in the right dosage. Someone else can say gluten is the worst thing in the world. It means nothing until you do the experimentation yourself and be like, oh, geez, I felt really good, uh, you know, not eating gluten at all. Um, then when I added it in in small amounts, I still felt good. But man, that one week where I had a lot of bread and pasta just because of things went on, I really felt sluggish and low energy and the brain fog came back again. Yeah. And then you have your own personal experience um, from what to go to. And then I usually, this is the other part, I usually tell people, once you have that personal experience, uh, don't spread it as gospel. Uh, as <laughs> yeah. that is that is what the, because that is your experience and yeah. someone else might do the exact same thing as you and not notice any change. Um, for sure, they might get a benefit. Um, and there's some things that we can universally accept that, yeah, if you eat like a lot less sugar in your life, you're going to be better off for it, like right. 100%. But like things like gluten and things like this are, are really individual. So like do your own experimentation and then encourage people not to do what you've done, but to do their own experimentation too. Yeah. Um, because when we know things to be like, like, a, like a personal truth or a personal concept, um, they're way, we're way more likely to follow them. Whereas if I'm like, well, geez, Nick, Nick does this and I look up to Nick and I like what he does. So I'm going to do it too, regardless of whether it works for me or not. That's, right. that's the wrong mentality. Whereas if I'm like, well, you know, Nick uses this bounce beam all the time. So I'm going to do it too. And then I'm like, wow, geez, my feet feel better. I have greater mobility, like all this other stuff. Then that's my like personal thing. Right. And right. then I'm going to have a way better relationship to it instead of just spreading like your truth. Yep. I agree. And that's way, the only way you can prove something to yourself uh, or believe something is truth is if you prove it to yourself. And I think, um, yeah, being willing to experiment and even just, you know, one thing you were saying that came to mind when you were mentioning things is that you have to actually live an examined experience to some extent to actually pay attention to these things, right? Like our world, and I've been tuning into, the, into this a lot more now to figure out like, how do we create uh, a digital platform that doesn't fall into the same trap of needing to find the money to support itself. So going down the road of distracting people or selling people's attention. Um, yeah. And I think living in this world of distraction, uh, it's really easy to not really pay attention to things like, how do I feel? 
How am I mentally? What did I just eat? Like some people can't even remember what they ate for breakfast. And it's like, maybe you should remember that because without understanding what you're putting in your mouth and connecting that to how you feel later, without being able to blend those two things, uh, you're not ever going to be able to figure this out. And you're always going to be kind of lost. It's like trying to go through a maze with, with the blindfold on if you're constantly distracting yourself from even listening to your own body. So I think the mind pillar ties directly in with food where the food you eat affects your mind, but you also have to have sort of an, a, a mindful way of living in order to pay attention enough to, to detect the patterns in the food you eat and how you feel to make sense of it. Because otherwise sense making is very hard. And I think we handicap ourselves because of the bigger forces at work right now that are making billions of dollars on our attention. And totally. it's, such a, it's such a nebulous thing that we don't even really realize. It's very sneaky. Um, so I think awareness in that respect of just like paying attention more, tuning in more, which, you know, when you're driving in your car on a meeting, going from one place to another, it's not the time to be able to tune into how you actually feel. So I think, yeah. uh, you know, I love some of Michael Pollan's um, heuristics where he's like, don't fuel your body where you fuel your car. Don't eat. If it comes out <laughs> of the in the window of your car, it's not food. You can eat it sometimes, but just don't kid yourself to think it's food. And um, totally. <laughs> yeah. But I really appreciate, and that's probably a good place to end off on is that personal, everyone is so individual that there are these overarching principles. Like it's good to know that we've essentially molded gluten over time to create a lot of potential causes for why we're having so many issues with it. Um, and, you know, you have to figure out in your life what things you can modulate and tune in enough to actually see if those things are working. And certainly having other people that might be going through the same issues can be a good support network to talk to and share data but don't assume, like you said, that because I'm sure I've been guilty of this many times where I figure something out. I'm like, oh, shit, this is the truth. You got to do this. And I think totally. for some things, yeah. for feet, that worked um, yeah. in terms of footwear. <laughs> but but I, don't, I don't think for food, it doesn't work as well. And in fact, the more you try and tell people what to do, the bigger barriers come up. Where it's like, stop, stop hounding me. And so uh, lead with your own behavior and then just share if people ask. And, and you've I remember you talked about that on one of our podcasts. It's like you don't have to tell people what to eat, but if they inquire, you can sort of give them some, don't give them the truth, give them some tools to discover the truth. And that's, that's the powerful part, I think. Yeah. And I think that's, again, the empowerment, right? Like you give people the tools to make their own decisions. It's the, it's the old metaphor saying, you know, if you, if you give a person a fish, they've got food for a day. And if you teach a person to fish, they're good for life. It, that yep. saying applies to so many things, right? If yep. you, tell people this is what you eat to be healthy, they're good for a bit. But if you show people this is what healthy feels like, find it on your own way, way more, way better results and way more empowering. Mm, that's great. Ooh, that, I really like, I got to listen to this again. And to listen <laughs> to that again. Um, Matt, thank you so much for your time. It's always a treat talking to you because I, Thanks, I, just, I love curiously asking people questions and knowing that like, we share such a similar mindset in how we discover truth and how we sort of articulate this stuff to people where it's not coming from a place of, I know, so you need to listen to me. It's like, this is what I found so far. And also this is some really interesting stuff that I didn't know. Like when I was researching gluten, even just like, I, I don't, I didn't actually know that gluten was a set of proteins shared by the, like a certain family of foods. I didn't know that. I, yeah. and it was, I was like, how did I not know this yeah. yet? And it's not um, scary, right? If you're like, yeah. gluten's a protein, people are like, oh, I know what a protein is. Well, right, now, right. therefore, gluten's not this scary, you know, because people are like, what is gluten? Is it a spray that's in bread? Is it, is right, it what is right. it, right? <laughs> and it's just a yeah. protein. It's just like, for some reason, a protein that's been just taken and like vilified. That poor thing's on a steak. <laughs> right. And I, and I love that you you didn't dive into like the crazy stuff where you said like a protein is a string of amino acids. It takes energy to break that down. Therefore, the more of this protein we have, the bigger burden we have to digest it. And you can overburden your system if you're having too much. When you said that, I was like, yeah, yeah it just makes, makes sense, sense. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the simplest way, you know, just to end there, like, I think it's always important to remember like corporations are there to make money first they're not there to make you feel nutritious, you know, like nutritionally aligned. They're not there to make, you know, even with shoes and stuff like that, it applies to so many things. Corporations are there to make a profit, like end of story. You, you have to know that going into it. Uh, and if you know that you can make educated decisions on the products you're buying. 
right? But I think it's really important to always like come from that concept that like if a corporation has cooked for you, or if a corporation for the most part has made your shoes for you, or done all this stuff, it's been done for profit. So you have to examine if it's a good product for you and for the environment and for whatever other kind of guidelines you want to follow, because uh, they they haven't done it (laughs) for those purposes, unless they think it's going to sell more product. I completely agree. And I think with food, and I've started to do this a lot more recently is like, build some relationships with other humans who find purpose in preparing food or in harvesting food. Like when I go to a farmer's market, I like, I love just talking to farmers and asking them questions. How do you grow this? How long have you been doing this for? Like, what, why do you do this? Why do you, farming's a hard ass job. Like what makes you want to continue doing that? So I might even have a couple of farmers I've met on the podcast just to pick their brain. Cause I think it's such a undervalued part of society and such an important part. And even like having a conversation with people at the bakery, it's like, it's really cool connecting with people, even if you're, I mean, you're not telling each other about your family history, but it's like, how's your day? You know, what, you like, why do you, what's, what in the world of bread is interesting you right now? And it's like, it's so funny. Some of the answers you get. So anyway, we hope that that was insightful and helpful. Um, go get your gluten-free water and we'll catch you next time. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Nick.